Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very honored to be here today. Um, when I told my Congolese friends I was coming to West Point to uh, give a presentation, uh, I confirmed all of their conspiracies about the U.S. wanting to invade the Congo. So uh, <laughs> I'm about to present you the plan for U.S. invasion of the DRC. Uh, I'm going to talk about an area of the world that many of you probably have not been to or know relatively little about. But the kind of dynamics I'm going to talk about, insurgency, peacekeeping, how to end armed conflict are dynamics that the U.S. government and the U.S. military are involved in in many places in the world. And I would argue some of these dynamics are very similar to what you see in the Congo. So I would like you to think about questions of Afghanistan, uh, ISIS, and other countries as I talk about uh, the Congo and, uh, and Africa. So some of the main messages I want to convey today, let me start off with the conclusions, um, is that and this is, I mean, this is going to seem banal, but the first premise of peacekeeping is really understanding who is fighting and why. Um, the, I think it was Sun Tzu who said that the, if you know yourself and you know your enemy, then a hundred battles will no longer matter. And that's exactly the point. And the problem in the Congo is that often we barged in the door through our way around, when I say us, the international community, without understanding what actually was going on. The second conclusion is that all military force, you guys are training to become military officers here, uh, but really the message here is that military force only really should be used in combination with the larger political strategy. Uh, this is, if you guys have read Clausewitz, I'm assuming that probably some of you read Clausewitz in your, in your course, all military, aim, military should only be used towards political ends. This is exactly one of the problems that we had in the DRC where military engagement was sometimes used without any political strategy at all. Um, often, the third point I want to make is that often what we want as outsiders coming into the country and what the people in the country want are completely different. And as long as our objectives and their objectives do not dovetail or overlap, often interventions will end in folly. And the last one is just repeating, I think what all three of these points is, is know thyself and know thy enemy. This is the Congo. Um, that's Africa, so it's uh, a famous uh, uh, writer, Frantz Fanon, once said, if Africa is a pistol, Congo's the trigger, and he meant that in more ways than one. Um, it's a country uh, at the center of Africa. If, if you compare it to the size of the United States, it's as big as all of continental United States east of the Mississippi River, so it's large. This is the eastern country, east of the country here, where the conflict is the worst. These little blotches on the map are armed groups. So you can see there's a lot of armed activity going on in the eastern Congo. That's this area right here. Overview of my presentation, overview of, sorry, overview of uh, what's going on today in the Congo. We're in the 18th year of conflict. The conflict began in 1996. Uh, 5.4 million people died. That's only between 1998 and 2007, so probably actually many more died. 95% um, of the deaths were because of the humanitarian fallout of the conflict. So these are people that were not killed with weapons. These are people who died due to hunger and starvation because of the conflict. The armies of nine African countries were involved. It's often called Africa's World War, around 50 armed groups. And it's been home to the largest United Nations peacekeeping mission in the world, costing $1.4 billion a year. It's not a lot for the US Army, but for the UN, that's the largest. And so I come to my first question, which is really what I started off with. If you want to understand a conflict and try to figure out what to do, well, then understand what's driving the conflict. We have several different theories that have been put forward. I'm going to put forward three theories and basically argue that all three of them are short-sighted. The first is that it's all about the economy. Uh, some of you may have heard that the conflict in the Congo is driven by natural resources. It's an easy shorthand to understand something that's happening a very long way away that everybody's battling over minerals and mines. But I think it's wrong. The second argument is that it's, all politics is local. And this is really just about local customary chiefs fighting over land. This is a land negotiation meeting. And that's really what's going on. It's really about local identities of people fighting over local tribal affiliations, customary property and identity. I think that's also short-sighted. The third one is that 
the Congo is just a mess. And this is a very easy sort of thing to do, but it's a, it's a, popular, it's a popular belief. The, our ambassador to the United Nations at one point said last year, Susan Rice, um, there was a big rebellion going on in the Eastern Congo called the M23, and she said, oh, who cares about the M23? If it weren't the M23, it would be some other armed group because the Congo is just such a big mess. And the idea here is that the whole state is the problem. You lack a central strong authority. It's, it's the state. Okay, those are the theories that I don't agree with. Let me tell you, give you a little bit of history before I tell you, give you my own theory of conflict in the Congo. The war began in 1996 <coughs> largely for three uh, reasons. First of all, it was the collapse of the Zairean state, the Congolese state, it was called Zaire at the time, after 32 years of misrule by the dictator Mobutu Sese Seko. Um, the second one was the Rwandan genocide in 1994 that sent almost a million people across the border from Rwanda, Rwanda is this tiny country here, into the eastern Congo. Um, and when the war started, it started around those refugee camps. It was actually a continuation of the Rwandan civil war. In other words, the people who had perpetrated the genocide fled into the eastern Congo, continued uh, launching attacks into Rwanda, the Rwandan army then invaded and ended up conquering the whole country. And the third thing that was going on is that there were struggles, uh, fights and struggles over local identity and power at the local level in the Eastern Congo that date back to the colonial period. Those three things came together in this very toxic cocktail um, and produced the Great Congo War of 1996. Nine countries were involved, those are the arrows that you see. And it ended up toppling the dictator Mobutu Sese Seko, who had been in power for 32 years, and putting uh, a gentleman called Laurent Kabila in power. That was the first Congo War. The second Congo War then happened because Laurent Kabila, the president, fell out with his backers, Uganda and Rwanda, um, uh, and they then launched a second war that basically split the country into three parts. One part controlled by Kabila and his government, one part controlled by the Rwandans and their allies, one part controlled by the Ugandans and their allies. That lasted from 1998 to 2003. And then in 2003, there was a peace process that began. And I want sort of to, and I, I'm spending a lot of time on this period because I really think that if you think about how to address violent conflict, this was pretty much one of the most complex difficult, intractable situations you can confront. You had the country split into three parts, dozens of different armed groups backed by different countries, neighboring countries, um, a state that was in complete shambles. And so you had a peace process that started in 2003 that I argue was actually a great success. And so we need to learn from this sort of peace process to understand it can provide valuable lessons of how to engage in situations of armed conflict. So what happened? You had all parties in 2002, actually, because in 2003 it, it, took, it took effect, sign a peace deal that created a national transitional government in which all belligerents took part. This is sort of 101 UN peace, uh, um, peacekeeping. You, you, you basically get everybody to sign a peace deal. You deploy UN peacekeeping troops to observe the peace deal, the ceasefire line. All the belligerents take part in a transitional government that then ends up in elections and everybody's either demobilized or joins the same national army. That's happened in many countries. That's exactly what happened in the Congo. It was hugely successful, but it also created problems. It favored some belligerents over others. So this again is the map of the Congo split into, broadly speaking, three parts. Forget about this part up here, these three parts. That's the state before the transitional government. The transitional government led to elections in 2006, right? Everybody joined with the expectation that may the best man or woman win, right? You're gonna go, the people are gonna be the arbiter of uh, who's gonna become president of the country. 61% um, of the National Assembly voted for President Kabila. A fair chunk voted for these guys up here it was backed by the Ugandans, and probably the strongest fighting force in the country, they occupied about a third of the most valuable and lucrative part of the country, were reduced to 4% representation in national institutions. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that this is a problem, right? 
Here you have, they're controlling an enormous amount of territory, they're controlling an enormous amount of wealth, and they're reduced to basically nothing in government. This was going to be a problem. So the peace deal was a huge success. It united the country. It had enormous amount of legitimacy. It de demobilized uh, over 100,000 um, uh, troops. Um, and the UN was doing what it does best, which is political sort of work of bringing people together in meetings, facilitating a transition. There was, there was a political process, right? And that was the important thing that everybody bought into. This is a gentleman, uh, the, the former American ambassador in Kinshasa, in the Congo, um, who led that UN effort. His name is uh, William Swing. Um, and so there was a lot of successes, but there was also a lot of failures. And those failures then produced a new war. Right? So remember I, went, I said that these guys here were disenfranchised. These guys were called the RCD. They became 4%. And so you had the marginalization of the RCD together with failed army reform, plus the pressure, pressures of elections created a new war, led by this gentleman here, a guy called Lohan Kunda. So what happened basically is the guys who had occupied a third of the country, who were reduced to almost nothing in national institutions, uh, they, they, they had a plan B in case the, the whole political process didn't work. And the plan B was this gentleman, Lohan Kunda. Um, the, the armed group that he led was backed by local elites, that's the Tutsi elite and the disaffected RCD officials, but also by the Rwandan government. So these are people, the armed group, if we go back here, this armed group had been backed by the Rwandan government, and so when they were marginalized, the Rwandan government felt that its interests had been marginalized, and so they backed a new rebellion. It, very small, really. In this area, this tiny area here, they occupied this area here, but it was perceived as the biggest threat to the Congolese state. The Congolese government deployed a vast number of troops out to the east, and it was involved in extremely brutal fighting that killed tens of thousands of people. Um, but that went together with another phenomenon, which is that you had the CNDP, which was this gentleman's armed group that was created, that was created because of the marginalization of the RCD, but at the same time you had a whole different, a whole plethora of armed groups spring up here. This is a UN military map. Each of these little uh, circles here is an armed group. Spring up through the east of the country for two factors, really. Remember I told you you had a transitional government? This is the way it pretty much works in most conflict situations where the UN is an arbiter. You bring in all these different armed groups, you merge them into the national government, you know, most of these armed groups were very top-heavy. They had probably 60% officers to 40% rank-and-file troops. Um, not obviously an ideal situation. And so there wasn't room in the National Army for everybody. Plus, a lot of these guys just didn't have the training or the confidence to become soldiers. They were illiterate. They had no formal military education. And so when they were sort of flung to the margins of the National Army, they defected and started new armed groups. At the same time, the, the, the whole the peace process said, we need to have elections. And so politicians were faced with a difficult new challenge, which was, how do I mobilize popular support? This is something they never had to do before, democratic elections. And so these two things together actually perversely gave rise to new insurrections because politicians, one of the things that they did in order to gain popular support, to intimidate their opponents, to show themselves as strong men, regional strong men, was mobilized militias. And so you had something that's very similar to other places. Afghanistan, I think, is probably a good example. You had the confluence of democracy and failed demobilization and army integration produced a petri dish of different armed groups throughout the country. This wasn't because rebellion was somehow intrinsically Congolese. There was a particular social and political dynamic in the country that was giving rise to arms, mobilization, and insurgency. You can see the result here. Here you had, as I said, the success of peace building. Here, this is what they, this was the peak of the war in 2002. Um, they really succeeded in this, these are um, internal displacement, which is a pretty good proxy for violence. It was a huge success. You got about two million people to go home. You saved tens of thousands of lives getting these people home. And then this new insurgency starts, and it goes up. That's a line that I drew. Uh, 
up to another high point last year of around 3 million people displaced in the country. So I'm going to fast forward here actually um, from 2008. So in Kunda, this gentleman's rebellion lasted until the end of 2008. Um, I'm going to fast forward. I'd be happy in the Q&A to get into sort of what's been going on since then. Not a whole lot has changed, just to give you the cliff notes. Uh, Nkunda's army was integrated into the national army. Um, the Congolese government was trying to co-opt them, basically. That didn't work. Um, there was a clash in 2012. Nkunda's armed group defected from the national army, created a new rebellion called the M23, uh, and that was defeated last year. And this dynamic, this broad dynamic of uh, politicians opportunistically using local militia for their own political aims, that has not gone away. So you still have around 50 different armed groups in the Eastern Congo, um, although you do no longer have the CNDP or the M23 in the Eastern Congo. So what are my main points? My main points are um, the peace process actually was a huge success, and we need to learn from, from the success in terms of how to deal with insurgencies, the main message being Insurgencies come out of a particular political situation, address that political situation. And the best way to do that is through a peace process, if that is possible. Nonetheless, even though the peace process was a huge success, it created a new war. In particular because it disenfranchised one of the most important participants in that process. Failure of army integration democratization created a new insurgency. That's my second point. And the third point, which is very important for outsiders to understand, is that uh, despite the fact that you had this escalation of violence here, right? So here the peace process lasted until 2006. This was when the heyday of UN intervention. Elections were held, the first democratic elections in 35 years were held in 2006. And the international community says, okay, you know, mission accomplished. And they said, we're going to phase into a technocratic post-conflict mission. We're in a post-conflict era. Now, anybody who looks at this graph here says, you've got to be crazy. What are you, what are you talking about post-conflict? Last year, we had almost as many IDPs in the country as we did at the height of the war. Certainly, people in the Eastern Congo would not recognize that they live in a post-conflict country uh, with 50 different armed groups. And yet, the UN and, for a large part, the international community were living in this post-conflict fiction and despite the fact that there was an enormous political problem in the country, there was no commensurate political solution. There was just a technocratic, technical solution. What do we need to do? We need to build roads. We need more police stations. Uh, we need to train officials. We need to work with the national government to uh, improve their data management systems. These are all great things, but these are not dealing with the core problem in the country, which was inherently political. <clears throat> so I'm now going to spring into a bit of an analysis. Let me, as I said before, if you want to engage in a country and really understand how a country works and why there is an insurgency in the country, you need to understand the main actors involved. These people are rational actors like you and me. They're doing the things, we may not understand why they're doing the things that they do, but they have good reasons. I'm not saying morally good reasons, but reasons that to them make a lot of sense. So this is the current president of the Congo, Joseph Kabila. What is he doing? Well, he rules through weakness, not strength. One of the core problems that we've had engaging with the country is that we actually assume that Joseph Kabila, the Congolese government, want to have a strong army. That's wrong. In fact, a lot of the logic of rule, the logic of patronage, in other words, distributing resources to clients around you, uh, to your ministers, to army officers, that sort of logic directly conflicts with the sort of meritocratic logic that a strong state is built upon, right? If you're told in the U.S. Army you're going to receive a promotion not because of your own skills and talents, but because of who you know and who you give kickbacks to and who your friends are, then you create a completely different kind of army than the one that you have currently in the United States. At least I hope you create a completely different kind of army. Um, and if you then come in and say, you know, you need, you need to go back to the meritocratic, meritocratic system where somebody gets promoted based on his inherent values, his strengths and talents, or her strengths and talents, 
then that clashes fundamentally. So if somebody came in, somebody comes, as we've done in the Congo, and said, you need to reform your army. This was one of the major projects. There's US military personnel deployed in the Congo today trying to deal with this issue. Um, Kabila sees a threat to his base. They say, creating a strong meritocratic army means firing or marginalizing people that I depend on, who may be complete idiots. Some of these people are illiterate. They're generals in the army. They haven't done a day of military training in their life. They can't even read or write. Um, but I need them because through them, they then have a whole loyal network of other military officers that they distribute money and opportunities to. And if I marginalize them, that they could rebel against me. Kabila also has a difficult personality. He makes very slow decisions. He proliferates chains of command, in other words, There'll be, he'll give several of his advisors exactly the same job and then pit them against each other. Not a good way of running a country, but sometimes a good way of surviving. And Kabila is a, a born survivalist. And his priority is exactly that, survival and not state reform. Okay, what about the guys next door? I mean, Rwandan government has been one of the big spoilers in this conflict since the beginning of the conflict. As I said, this, the, the war started with Rwanda in 1996. In order to understand, to bring an end to the conflict, you really need to understand why, Rwanda, what Rwanda is in it for. This is the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, hailed by many as a visionary, a very strong leader. He's very different from Joseph Kabila. He's not a slow decision maker. He's not a recluse. He's not an introvert. He's somebody who knows what he wants, who has a vision for his country. He's extremely determined, ambitious, uh, and many would say, as I said, a visionary. Um, the legacy of genocide draws, drives many things in Rwanda. This is a country where a million people were butchered over 30 days, largely with machetes. Um, that leaves a mark on the psyche of a country. The government that's in power today believes that it is, ha legitimately holds power because it overthrew that government that carried out the genocide. And Everything that it does, it says it does in order to protect the country from more violence and bloodshed. Um, that makes it extremely belligerent and paranoid. It's also led by a small clique, uh, uh, so Kagame himself and the people around him come from an ethnic community that is the minority. This was the community that was targeted and a large part of which was butchered during the genocide, the Tutsi community. It makes it very sensitive and paranoid, it sees conspiracies everywhere. The other problem is that it's built its whole government, um, um, it's, very author it's a very authoritarian government, and it's increasingly uh, suffered from defections, from splits, as authoritarian governments often do. This makes them all the more paranoid and react even more belligerently. And when it sees a danger in the Congo, it reacts, I think, in a disproportionate fashion, both because of that paranoia, but also because people, the officers who are involved in decision making in the Congo, are trying to outdo each other. So there's a particular sort of pernicious dynamic within the inner circle of decision makers uh, in the Rwandan government that tends towards belligerency. And you need to understand that. Many often diplomats in Kigali, I would go to Kigali, uh, the capital of Rwanda, and I'd say, you know, look, the Rwandan government, here's evidence, the Rwandan government supporting armed groups in the Eastern Congo, which it denies. And diplomats would tell me, but that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in your head. It makes sense in their heads. You have to put yourself in their head. And that is often an extreme, especially in Rwanda, which is a very, very closed society. It takes you years to get to know people. It's very difficult to do. And let's look at ourselves. What's the logic of conflict? You know, the international community, we, 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 pay, we pay for at least half of the Congolese budget, around half of the Rwandan budget. We can't say that we're not involved in this conflict. We are. We want to be involved in this conflict. We're part and parcel of the conflict to a certain extent. What's in it for us? What's the, how do we involve in this logic of conflict? Well, the first thing we have to recognize is that there's almost no political interest in domestic public. You go out in the street in the United States and ask somebody where the Congo is, 90% of people will not be able to find Congo on a map. Uh, it is one of the most severe humanitarian catastrophes of our times, but there's almost, in terms of the list of priorities, 
it ranks very far down. My Congolese, for, which is strange for Congolese because the United States for them looms large, very, very large. The Congo, we don't even register the Congo on our radar. So you go to the Congo, my, my friends in the Congo are, and these are people in government, uh, are convinced that you know, President Obama begins his morning briefing with the Congo briefing every morning. And uh, you know, I, I try very hard to convince them that's not the case. Um, and yet we play an enormous role there. So you have this, this disconnect between um, our role there, which is huge, and the Congo's importance for us, which is insignificant. And so it's no surprise that we respond with enormous amount of humanitarian aid. We spend a lot of money on the Congo. Money is not necessarily the problem. Uh, the Congo receives about $4 billion in aid each year. Um, that includes $1.4 billion in a peacekeeping mission. This is a country that has a budget of around $8 billion. But there's almost no political or military engagement. In fact, you have bizarre situations, uh, as we had here in this country, for, or as we had during the M23 crisis, for example, um, where personal predilections of leaders in the United States or Europe their own personal views can play a role, precisely because there is no overriding national interest. The U.S. has almost no national interest in this region, right? Whatever we do there is just gravy on top, because we have no national interest there, no real overriding. This is not Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Mexico, Europe, Canada, no. This is on the very fringes of our national interest. And so it is possible, for example, for Susan Rice, who was the U.S. Ambassador at the United Nations, who has a very close personal relationship with Paul Kagame, to make decisions based on her own gut intuition and not on national interests. Because she was never called out on it because it's not a matter of national interest. I would go to briefings at the State Department where State Department officials would pull me aside and say, you have to do something about, and not that I could do anything about it, but you have to do something about Susan Rice. One person. You know, it's a f and, it's, and this happens because it is not in our national interest. So these small, small um, flukes can, can play a role. Uh, ideological bias can play, a big, uh, can play a big role. We see Rwanda as this visionary country. We see the Congo as a mess. That plays a role. Um, and we can be susceptible to bureaucratic incentives. You start up a program, a huge program in the Congo, training its soldiers, for example, or financial reform package by the World Bank, the last thing you want to do is shut it down. If you're the head of the World Bank office in the Congo, the last phone call you want to make to your boss in Washington is saying, it's actually not working. The country is completely corrupt. These guys here have absolutely no political will to do anything. Let's just shut the program down. That's going to cost you your career, not your career, but it's not going to be good for your career. You want to say the opposite. Oh, things are going great. We need to increase the package. We need to increase money. And similarly, um, Army reform is the same thing. The last thing you want to do is stop reforming the army. Obviously, it still needs reform. Yeah, there's some problems, but you don't want to undermine what you've done in the past. It's sort of this too big to fail sort of problem. The Congo goes so big, we have to be there, even if what we're doing there actually may be part of the problem. Um, so specifically, the problem, the, our failures specifically in terms of the peace building process, I think were the following. We fail to diagnose the problem. Remember I started off the presentation saying the first thing you need to do is understand what the problem is. If there is an insurgency, what is, what's behind that insurgency? We fail to diagnose that. We saw the CNDP that emerged as the strongest challenge to stability in the Congo in 2004. We saw it as either, you know, a local armed group that was built around local grievances. And we didn't see it for what it was, which was an a, a, a tactic by local elites and the Rwandan government to protect their interests. We were reluctant to sanction Rwanda. Rwanda was the biggest influence behind the CNDP, but it was also a huge success story. You have Bill Clinton going to Rwanda. Bill Clinton feels hugely guilty because of the lack of the United States, its failure to act during the genocide in 1994. He's a great friend of Paul Kagame. Bill Gates is a great friend of Downtown Kigali, you see the Bill Gates Convention, the convention Center. Uh, Tony Blair has, uh, the former president, uh, prime minister of the UK, he has a foundation that puts advisors, the Tony Blair Foundation, that puts advisors in Paul Kagame's office. You have Rick Warren, the pastor of Saddleback Church in California, 
correct? Um, one of the, a huge, uh, hugely important figure in terms of a uh, religious figure. He says that uh, Rwanda is the first purpose-driven country in the world, right? He wrote the book, The Purpose-Driven Purpose Life, is that what it was called? Uh, and so um, it has a lot of backers. And so in order to say actually that's not true, what you think about Rwanda is not correct, it's actually playing a negative role, required so many people to change the narrative that they were reluctant to do that. And that was a big failure. Again, they didn't do it because at the end of the day, the Congo was insignificant for people. It didn't register. Um, and then there was this assumption that the Congo had entered into a post-conflict phase. That we were dealing really with the problem was really building a strong state. That's all we really need to do. You build a strong state and the problem's going to go away. It's about training officers, tra uh, putting up police stations, and then it's, the problem's going to go away. I remember in uh, 2010 uh, to 2012, donors spent $300 million doing exactly that. And what happened? They built police stations where the police officers weren't paid. They built roads that after the rainy season are washed away again. Uh, exactly, sounds familiar because it's a, it's a story that happens in many places where we, outsiders try to come in and fix a problem that's inherently political, inherently embedded in local society, and you try to engineer it from the outside, it doesn't work. So what's the way forward? Now, it sounds crazy, but I am a firm believer in Congolese institutions. Now, if you go to a Congolese institution, you'll think I'm insane. You go to Parliament in, in Kinshasa, and it smells of urine, the toilets don't work. Uh, two days ago, in a parliamentary debate, the parliamentarians got into a fist fight in the aisles. Um, it is the, 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 be, the easiest way of passing, or the most common way of passing uh, legislation is by bribing everybody you want to, to pass legislation. There's actually a word they use for it. It's called uh, enveloperie, which is the French word for envelopes, because everybody gets an envelope full of US dollars. Uh, so you'd say, you're crazy, this doesn't work. What are you saying, empower Congolese institutions? It's because the legacy and the beauty of the Congo is that Congolese leaders always make, end up making institutions that end up holding them accountable. So they create monsters that they're no longer able to control, except from our point of view, those are good monsters. So for example, uh, the President Kabila, uh, there's this whole pretense that we're going to protect human rights and we're going to build this framework of democracy and whatnot, and they think it's a joke when they build it. And then, you know, a couple years later, they're like, wait a second, I have a parliament that I have to, have to go through to pass laws, and there's a, a judiciary and a legal process that I have to go through. Sure, they might be able to bribe some people, but it's still a problem. It's not Jeffersonian democracy, but it is a somehow weirdly functioning political system that ends up holding people accountable. Currently, for example, the President Kabila is in a difficult situation where he's trying, he's, he's been in power now for uh, 14 years, 13 years. Uh, he, according to the Constitution, cannot run again for president. He's term limited. And so he really wants to change the Constitution. It's a very difficult for him to change the Constitution. The Catholic Church just came out. The Pope just came out saying, don't do it. What are you going to do if the Pope says don't do it? Um, so he has empowered Congolese, you know, believe in this corrupt mess, this chaos, which is Congolese civil society and political elites that actually is much more promising than I think many outsiders would believe it to be. <coughs> Change your approach to peace, to, to peace building. <coughs> now you'd be amazed, you know, we spend $4 billion a year on, on the conflict in the Congo, very broadly speaking. Maybe about $2 billion directly on the conflict. You'd be amazed to the degree to which all that money is spent without understanding what is driving the conflict? I was the, the head of a UN, it's called the UN Group of Experts. It's, uh, it's mandated by the UN Security Council. Uh, there's a very similar one on Al-Qaeda and Taliban, for example. And our job was follow the money. Who's behind armed groups? Who's backing these guys, right? So in 2008, I went out there and I did a lot of investigative work with our team. And one of our conclusions was, the Rwandan government is really, really backing the CNDP armed group, and that's a big problem. We need to deal with that. I would go to embassies in Kigali and Kinshasa where I was laughed out of the room. And now, in retrospect, everybody says, well, actually, that was right. I'm not trying to blow my own horn here. I was just, the point is, is that it was amazing the extent to which, I mean, think about U.S. involvement in, in, uh, in Afghanistan, right? 
your military officers. One of the core challenges of figuring out what's driving the Taliban has to be understanding their financial and political networks. Questions such as, to what degree is the ISI in Pakistan, the intelligence services in Pakistan, backing and propping up the Taliban? Now, I assume there are hundreds of people in the US defense establishment obsessed with this, this sole question, as they should be. The point is, is that in the terms of the Congo, we're throwing a lot of money at a problem without understanding what that problem was. And so it's a very fundamental point. It's a very simple point. Um, but somehow it's a point that never really uh, was appreciated by many of the decision makers. Technocracy. I came to the graduation ceremony here earlier this year. President Obama said something that I believe is absolutely correct. If you have a, ham if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And in the Congo, because all of a sudden we had transitioned into this post-conflict period, we thought everything was a post-conflict problem, right? But that was just a definitional problem, because we had somehow ca called it post-conflict, therefore it would become post-conflict. And yet, violence was escalating, and you still had 50 armed groups on the ground. But because you had changed the nature of the mission, and you brought in a bunch of technocrats from outside who said, hey, I know how to do a demobilization program, hey, I know how to do a, an army reform, reform project, all of a sudden, these guys became the leading voices in the room. And people who said, well, wait a second, isn't, isn't the whole frame of reference wrong? That we're not in a post-conflict phase? This is still an ongoing conflict, and there are certain parties here that really need to be dealt with? They got sort of silenced. And that was a big problem. So you need to check incentives towards self-legitimation and perpetuation, and you need to know how when to draw the plug, right? It's a very difficult decision to make. I'm just going to get, you know, I'm going to leave the country. The Congolese government always calls our bluff. When we say, you know what, you've got problems, you don't, you're, not, you're not really playing ball with us here. We're trying to help you out build a strong army and strong institutions, but you're not a willing partner. The Congolese government always calls our bluff and says, okay, leave. Fine, what do we care? Go. We'll find another partner. And we always stay. One of the paradoxes of the Congo is that even though we provide them with half their budget, even though we basically prop up the government with a peacekeeping mission in the east of the country, we need them more than they need us. And that is a very bizarre paradox, but that's part of the problem in this position, this case. Uh, you need more investment analysis and understanding. I made that point, and it's an entirely sort of uh, self-interested point because that's my job. Um, so what are the broader policy implications, things that try to bring this back to where more people in this room may be thinking about, quite problems they may be thinking about? Well, think about the Anbar awakening, which is probably something that many of you in this room have thought about or heard about in Iraq, the sons of Iraq, uh, the surge, the whole strategy of the surge in Iraq under George W. Bush. Uh, its success, uh, at least a large part of it, was because Iraqi society, or a large part of Iraqi society, was on board. We were able to bring in um, Sunni tribal chiefs in Anbar province against Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, and to what extent was that due to the peasants? If you look at coin doctrine, it's all about hearts and minds. But was it really about hearts and minds of the peasants? Or was it about the tribal sheikhs? Where is the, 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 where is the social locus of an insurgency based? Or a different question, but very similar. We're talking about this over lunch. If you look at ISIS today. Now, is dealing with ISIS, should that be a question of dealing with the former Ba'athists? Because we know that some of Saddam's people are part of ISIS. Should it be dealing with the same tribal leaders who were with us back in the Anbar awakening, but are no longer with us? Is that the problem? Is it former Al-Qaeda in Iraq leaders, like Baghdadi? Is that the constituency you need to deal with? Or is it the foreign fighters? Now, you'll tell me it's all of those. But understanding the exact dynamics between those different pieces is key. It could be that, well, if you only get, I mean, Part of the strategy now is to bring in, uh, bring across again, win over the tribal leaders in Iraq. Maybe that's not, I mean, if, they're, if they actually play no role in ISIS, if they're just there because they're under the thumb of all these military leaders, maybe all of that effort isn't, I don't know, but maybe that's, that, all that effort is not uh, actually as useful as, as some make it out to be. We need to understand the interests of parties. Now, a whole situation that I described to you about the Congolese government not being a willing partner and actually you have this, I call it the autoimmune syndrome. The Congolese government is funding armed groups. Members of the Congolese government are funding armed groups that then fight its own government, right? 
sort of an autoimmune syndrome. Well, it's, you know, in the, Afghan in the Afghanistan context, you had a very similar situation. And so you really need to understand before you go in and assume that we're dealing with the government, that all the government wants to do is create a strong army, a strong state, and deal with the Taliban, or deal, in the case of Yemen, for example, deal with these various tribal militias, you are making a very strong assumption that may well be a false assumption. Um, and so we need to understand interests. So thank you very much. Uh, I left hopefully some time for questions and answers. Yes, but not enough. But, uh, but thank you very much. Sh yeah, sh uh, yeah. Right. However, they don't register in our national interest. Can you explain that to us? So, um, it's a complicated situation. You know, you go to, I go to embassies, embassies in Kinshasa, right? And as I said, these are embassies that participate in funding, in the, funding the colonies' budget to the tune of 50%, right? And so they need us, you know, they, in theory, they should need us because we fund, you know, education, healthcare, infrastructure improvement, all this stuff. And so in theory, they need us because we're there to prop them up. But at the end of the day, um, uh, they actually play us in several different ways. First of all, they don't really need health care and education because it doesn't go into their pockets, right? So they're like, okay, fund health care and education, what do we care? Or don't fund health care and education, we're not the people who are dying if you don't fund a hospital. So we think actually gives us leverage, may not give us leverage. Uh, secondly, they play us against each other, the donor community. So the French, why did the French care about the Congo? The Congo is the biggest speaking French country in the world, right? And the French feel they need to have a foot there. And so when we go to the Congo, when we go and say, for example, oh, President Kabila, you can't change the constitution, that's not good for democracy in the country, he then goes to Paris, where he says, well, you know, we can give you access to this mining concession, or we'll allow you to uh, open up a new cultural center or something like that and they get a different answer from the French. So that's another problem. And another problem, I think, is just the fact that nobody wants to shut down what is already there. <coughs> it's this too big to fail syndrome. The Congo, we have to be in the Congo. It doesn't matter if it's not working. We just have to be in the Congo. Who wants to, for example, the peacekeeping mission comes under a lot of criticism for not doing good work. But do you want to be the guy who withdraws a peacekeeping mission from the country? It's very, very difficult to do. Um, you know, our president has had to withdraw, I mean, he's supposed to be the drawdown president. He's no longer, I guess, the drawdown president, but he was trying to be the drawdown president. Came up against a lot of pushback from a lot of different quarters because you're shutting down, not only are you shutting down what some people need, you're shutting down an entire economies. You know, uh, a large part of the Congolese economy is that when the UN peacekeeping mission recently moved from Kinshasa to the east of the country, um, apartment prices in Kinshasa dropped by 40%. Just because in that particular elite class, Right? So many of those elite members of people who are renting apartments came from the peacekeeping mission. So it's a complicated dynamic, but the result is that paradoxically, I go to the embassies in Kinshasa and they say we don't have leverage on a country that they bankroll. You know, similarly, if you look at, you know, this is a weird situation with uh, Hamid Karzai in Afghanistan. You know, it was even more dramatic in Afghanistan. We, were, we thought we were you know, preventing, if we left Afghanistan financially and militarily, the Taliban would overrun Kabul. And we were providing, I think, much larger proportion of the Afghani budget uh, than we were of the Congolese budget. And yet, he kept on telling us, well, go. We don't need you. Leave. And you know, that has to do with his own personality, I think. But um, um, it's something you see around the world. Uh, yeah. Go the, there, there, and then here. Is China interested in the DRC, and is Joseph Kabila interested in China? Absolutely, yes. China is becoming more and more involved in Africa uh, for several different reasons. China is coming out of its um, Deng Xiaoping sort of era of uh, non-intervention in other people's affairs. They have this new presence around the world, and then, of course, they need natural resources for their economic engine. This is the case uh, in both Southeast Asia, South Asia, as well as Africa. And it certainly is the case in the Congo. They signed a $6 billion infrastructure deal in the Congo. This is um, it's basically a, a barter deal where they give $6 billion to the Congolese uh, 
uh, in funding for various projects. They build railroads, roads, hospitals, and schools for them, and in return they get access to resources. Uh, so that's, there used to be a sentiment in Kinshasa that that means that we no longer need Western donors. But first of all, $6 billion over 10 years is not that much money. Um, and secondly, that whole thing didn't go as smoothly as either party thought. China's facing, you know, because this is sort of a new phase for it in, in its Africa policy, it's coming face to face with the fact that it's not that easy to do all these things they want to do. So um, they're having a big problem with corruption. They have a big problem with infrastructure. Mining projects require electricity. They require roads. And this is not working out for them as well as it was. So the, I think they're... Um, um, the flirting between Kinshasa and Beijing has diminished, and Kabila, as many other African countries, has realized that they cannot completely forsake their former Western uh, friends. Kenya is going through a similar situation, uh, Angola to a certain extent as well. Yes? I don't think that, uh, th so the FTLR is a former Rwandan, re is a rebel group that um, includes members of the government that committed the genocide in Rwanda in 1994. Um, I think that the best way of dealing with the FTLR is both political and military. And I don't mean by uh, negotiations with the FTLR to bring them into a government or something like that, but I think that um, there are a lot of members of the FTLR leadership who won out. The, the very few of them left. There's about 1,500 of them left. About 2,000, and at least my colleagues in Rwanda in private agree with me, that's more or less it. They don't have the capacity to invade the Rwanda to, 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 in, in a significant fashion. They can carry out cross-border raids. Uh, you had this last year. You've had a little bit of this this year. Um, the last big invasion was in 2001, and then about 1,000 of them were killed. So they, they realized that they basically, they're no, they're no strategic threat to Rwanda, but they're certainly a tactical threat. Um, I think a lot of them want out. If you provide a way of getting some of the top leadership out, they'll go. So if you say, we're going to provide you with a safe house in Maputo, or provi provided they, weren't part they didn't participate in the genocide, get those guys out and deal with the rest of them in a military fashion. I think Rwandan troops on Congolese soil is such a large controversy that it's probably not worth, wor worth that effort. On the other hand, the Congolese government and the UN certainly need to do a better job in, in dismantling the FDLR. There's no doubt about it. Well, the question is, how much are they really doing? I mean, I think there's, uh, there's been some inflation of the threat by the Rwandan government. I understand that, you know, the Rwandan government, when I talked to them, said, well, you know, if you had al-Qaeda based in Tijuana, and they were raiding, you know, across the border into the United States, would the United States not raid? And of course they would. But it's a, it's a matter of proportionality. You know, if you, if there are, you know, over the past two years, there's probably been two or three casualties in Rwanda because of FDLR cross-border raids. I don't have the exact figures, but it's something on that order. I don't think that justifies or merits what would happen if Rwanda invaded the Congo, which is broad-scale de destabilization. And so I, I, unless there is a serious, a, a more serious threat, I don't think it's worth that. <coughs> yeah. I think we had, I think it was you first, yeah. Is there a uh, war in part of history? How much, when it comes to identities, how much do stakeholders, tribal leaders, so to speak, in Eastern Congo recognize Congo as a legitimate nation state or, or on the other side of the border with Rwanda and Uganda? How many identities really transcend those current political borders? So the, there's, a, the, there's, a, there's a population, there's a cross-border population, um, um, well, a, a couple ways of answering that question. First of all, the Congolese state, in terms of its infrastructure and organization, is very weak. In terms of a national identity, is very strong. And so Congolese are extremely proud of being Congolese. They're also extremely angry that their country is such a mess. And so uh, it's not the case where, for example, they have greater loyalty to their own tribal identity than to the nation. Or that depends on which ethnic group you're talking about, but broadly speaking, I think that would be the case. There are one or two exceptions. There is a large population of Kinyarwanda speaking people, so people who, have, who trace their heritage back to Rwanda, um, uh, who have fought at certain points in time for the Rwandan army, but are Congolese. That's more of a complicated situation. But broadly speaking, I think that most Congolese uh, adhere to the, to, the to the national state. And in terms of tribal structures, you know, most tribal structures in the Eastern Congo are relatively weak. 
In other words, you do, you're, not, you're not in a situation where the first, if you go into an area, the first person you have to talk to is a customary chief. No. The first person you have to talk to is probably in order of, magnet, in order of importance, the military commander, the territorial administrator, who's a, polit who's a politician or a, politically, a political appointee, uh, and then perhaps number, two or th number three or four would be then the customary leader. Uh, but they're not, uh, as in some other parts of Africa, they're not that important. But it depends on which area you're going to, but broadly speaking, that's probably the case. Yes? Uh, one of the things you talk about in your book is how the Congo War is trying to almost shift to the generational ideological change so that um, the downfall of Mobutu and then uh, even Laurent Kabila, uh, Laurent Kabila to an extent, was his usurpation by these, um, a younger generation of kind of more neoliberal minded um, uh, African leaders. Do you think that the kind of the rejection of, a, of, of that 1960s or 70s notion of, of state uh, of social, uh, state-sponsored socialism or nationalization of, of commodities has gone by the wayside? Do you think this violence is a reflection of kind of the influx of neoliberal ideas or kind of almost neocolonialism or neo-imperialism into Africa, or, or what are your thoughts? Well, there's been a broad-scale shift. You know, the, the modus operandi for rebels in Africa in the 1960s and 70s, the frame of reference that they often, you know, used was Marxism. You know, you had Che in the Congo in 1964, 60, sorry, 1965, he was in the Congo. Um, many of the leaders in the 1970s called themselves Marxists, certainly the Ugandans, the Eritreans, the Ethiopians, the Sudanese, the, they were all, the Congolese, they were all, that's, you know, if you're a rebel, you're a Marxist. That's what you do. After all, you know, all of the great uh, books on insurgency and, rebe and revolutionary warfare were Che, Mao, uh, Cabral, et cetera, et cetera. Ho Chi Minh, and so that was a, a natural frame of reference. That's disappeared in a very stark, in a very sort of dramatic way. Uh, the governments that came to power that were Marxist revolutionaries all became neoliberals. The Rwandans, the Ugandans, the Ethiopians, the Eritreans, the Sudanese. Um, and the rebels today really don't make too much allusion to that anymore. In fact, there's an there's a, a ideological void uh, amongst in the rebellions. Some of them fall back more on sort of the tribal ethnic discourse, you know. Now, what is coming more to the front is a nationalist discourse. You know, the Congolese, one of the probably the, the biggest um, sort of uh, more striking things you'll hear when talking to a Congolese politician is the degree to which they feel humiliated by the fact that their big country, a huge country, 70 million strong, enormous, with vast riches, has been trampled on by every country in the world, you name it. The Americans, the Belgians, uh, the French, the Iranians, the Uga everybody's humiliated them. And so this feeling of humiliation drives a deep sense of nationalism that sometimes expresses in itself in a way that may seem familiar in the 1960s sort of Marxist lens, but it doesn't uh, ref And so when they talk about nationalization of resources, it's mostly not because, you know, Marxist doctrine, but because we need to run our own show, get out of our country. Make the country strong, and and you know, and you know the older generation, the people who are 50 or 60, they'll still make that sort of reference to Marxism, but that's really dying out very, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, Return this back towards like an American focus uh, for you know, future officers. Um, you know, what I get from your presentation is you say, "Know thyself, know thy enemy." Right. Um, and in a large way, the Congolese government is the enemy. Um, if you are a member of Africom right. developing political right. strategies. Right. And you possibly identify the center of gravity is the Congolese government. How do you then go in there and conduct reforms? I think that you first of all need to be, you know, clarity of vision, clarity of purpose. What can I do and what should I do? Um, you need to be modest in your ambitions. There are certain things we can do in the Congo and certain things we've done well. The transition, I think, was a great example of where we were able to bring we, the international community, but also the United States bring to bear our political capital and influence, financial capital and influence, to bring everybody around a table and to create what to a certain extent was a very successful process. At the same time, a lot of the fundamental dynamics of Congolese society, corruption, uh, abuse, uh, some of these problems of insurgency, we're not going to be able to deal with. Um, and so I think, you know, we need to be, understand what our, I think, for example, the FGLR that one of the cadets was mentioning is a pro is a problem that we can tackle and we can get rid of. If you get rid of the FDLR, if you get rid of some of these foreign armed groups in the Eastern Congo, the LRA, for example, 
you could reduce um, the conflict by an order of magnitude. You'll still have the fundamental drivers of, uh, you know, neo-patrimonialism, um, a, a very sort of uh, uh, negative confluence of politics and military sort of opportunism driving the conflict. You're not going to be able to deal with that. Not, no training mission is going to be able to deal with that. No, uh, no amount of infrastructure building is going to deal with that. Um, but maybe we shouldn't deal with that. I, mean, that's another, I think that's, it's key to know what we can do and what we can do and go with a very clear idea about that and then get out because actually you can have, you can have a perverse uh, dependency also created by being there for too long and making them believe that we can fix everything. In the Congo, for example, as I was saying, I think it's a problem. I remember talking to a Congolese, and I, I think I'll probably have to end with this, but I remember talking to a Congolese um, on this is this, numerous occasions this metaphor came up, but I was talking to a Congolese on a boat uh, I was on a river in the Congo, and, uh, and I said, you know, what do you think is driving the conflict in your country? This guy was a traitor. And he said, you know Bob Marley? I said, yeah, I know. I've listened to Bob Marley before. He says, he's got this song called Babylon System. So I'm not sure you guys are familiar with Babylon System, but Babylon System, the song goes, Babylon System is the vampire that's sucking our blood. He says, you, United States, you're Babylon. You're sucking our blood. And, you know, there are, the U.S. has played not always a positive role. But it certainly is not Babylon. Um, its main sin is sins of omission, negligence, and ignorance at the moment. And the fact that the Congolese are stuck in, I think, this mentality of dependency, it's always some guy in Washington that's going to be calling the shots, is actually, I think, negative for their own development. They need to hold their own leaders responsible before you know, the problem is not in Washington. The problem is in Kinshasa much more than it is in Washington. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. Uh, on behalf of the United States Military Academy, I'd like to present you a small token of our appreciation. It's a West Point pad, so you can go out and uh, write notes in the field when you can't uh, get access to your laptop or electrical grid. <laughs> so, so, is it like bugged or something like that? Where they, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.